right, I think we can probably get started. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We have such a fantastic crowd. Before I forget, Kara asked me to please remind everybody when you're tweeting, um, or if you're going to tweet from the event, to please tweet with the IHPI18 hashtag. So I don't want to forget that, so I'm going to let everybody know now, IHPI18. Um, my name is Lindsay Admin. I just finished the Clinician Scholars Program here at IHPI um, just a few weeks ago, actually. I'm an OBGYN, and um, I just started as an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology here at the University of Michigan. And I'm super excited for the opportunity to introduce our speaker today. Um, our speaker is Jonathan Cohn. He's a senior national correspondent at the Huffington Post. He writes about politics and policy with a focus on social welfare. And we're super lucky to have him here um, talking to us today. Um, he's also the author of Sick, the untold story of America's healthcare crisis and the people who pay the price. Jonathan worked previously at the New Republic in American Prospect and has written for the Atlantic, New York Times, and for Self. His journalism has won awards from many organizations, including the Sidney Hillman Foundation, the Association of Healthcare Journalists, World Hunger Year, and the National Women's Political Caucus. Um, we're very excited for his talk today, and please join me in welcoming him. Um, Uh, thank you for the introduction. How many of you were here last year when I spoke? Oh, that's a lot of people. Okay, so I don't know how well you remember, but there was a little drama last time. Um, literally, quite literally, you know, the Senate was in the middle of uh, debating one of the repeal bills. I was literally sitting there with my phone, like, you know, I was like, what, what, you know, what's going to happen? Will, will what I say at the beginning of the speech still be true at the end of the speech? Um, and... You know, honestly, you know, giving that talk, uh, I, you know, I couldn't tell you with any confidence whether the Affordable Care Act would still be in existence a week later, let alone a month or beyond that. Um, but here we are one year later. Affordable Care Act is still on the books, and at least for the moment, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to this, but at least for the moment, it seems to be uh, uh, safe from repeal. But I'm here to tell you the drama hasn't ended I have my phone. <laughs> There's a reason I have my phone. Like an hour ago, literally, the uh, Trump administration posted that they're about to release a new regulation uh, about uh, uh, different kinds of insurance plans that will be available and how that might change the market. And that will be a very big deal, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. It's actually possible that by the time I get to that point in my speech, I'll be able to tell you confidently what the regulation says, because it will have come out. But we're going to just pause on that for a moment. We'll just, you know, pretend for now that, that nothing has changed and that I actually know with great confidence what the world will look like in an hour at least, if not a week or a, a, a month. But, yeah, the ACA is still here. And uh, uh, it's here, it seems to be at least for the interim future. There's no plans to repeal it right now. Um, and, and, and in a way... Whatever is about to happen, we're at a moment that we really, you know, someone I could tell you is someone who's been writing about this and covering the Affordable Care Act since it was first a glint in Barack Obama's and John Gruber's eyes, um, that, you know, you can actually take a step back and say, you know, all right, well, where are we really? What has, you know, what, what got done? What, was, what went right? What went wrong? What just happened way differently than um, anybody uh, uh, anticipated? Um, and it's kind of a neat moment, actually, because ever since um, about a decade ago, about 2008, we were kind of locked into this conversation, a very narrow band of what was possible. It was like, are we going to reform the health care in a, in, a, in a very specific way that the Democratic Party had kind of coalesced around, or are we not? And then once they passed that law, the debate became, all right, well, are we going to get rid of that law, or are we going to keep it? Now, we're still having that. I, I, I'm going to say this like 10 times today, and this is like my third, I think, already. Like, it could still get repealed, and I, and I believe that. Um, but really, for the first time, I think since the early part of the last decade, yeah, right, early part of the last decade, it's actually possible to think bigger thoughts and think, all right, well, if you really wanted to, we really, you know, you really got another shot at passing major health care legislation, and you wanted to do something even more ambitious, what would that look like? And that's what I want to cover today. I want to talk about a little history of the Affordable Care Act, how we got to where we are, what happened under the Obama administration, what has happened under the Trump administration, 
and then going forward the different paths um, that we could take. Now those of you who have heard me talk before know I'm a big believer that you can't understand where we're going if you don't know where we've been and you have to understand history and the sort of history of American health insurance. So very quickly, I apologize for those of you who have heard this before, you know, but you know, Bruce Springsteen was at Billy Joel last night and playing Born to Run, so if he can do Born to Run, I can do my quick <laughs> history. She's, she's, my wife who's sitting in the corner is really happy that I mentioned Bruce Springsteen I wanted to be and not Billy Joel. It's like this running thing we have in our house. She thinks it's really dorky, but, you know, whatever. Okay. So, uh, um, history, a brief history of American health insurance. Think the REM song, you know, start, you know, like that boom, boom, boom. Okay, we're going to do this real quick. So, uh, medicine, as we know, modern medicine uh, began really uh, at the early 20th century, late 19th century. You know, before that, medicine was just basically a crapshoot. If you got sick, you went to the doctor, they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, but uh, starting around the beginning of the 20th century, late 19th century, they learned uh, to use anesthesia. Uh, they learned about the sanitary technique. You could really do surgery and operations. And really for the first time, uh, medicine, people who provided medicine were confident they could actually make you better. Um, they could actually cure diseases. Uh, they could do surgery and things like that. And that led to this giant explosion of uh, medical technology and medical know-how. And that was great. So for the first time, you know, people are uh, uh, getting sick. They're actually getting better. But of course, for the first time now, it's getting expensive. You know, for the first time, you actually have to pay a lot to get better. You know, previously, if you got sick, your big worry was, I'm going to be out of the work for two or three weeks. How am I going to pay my rent and my salary? Now, you had a first worry about, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to have, uh, have to pay the doctor, have to pay the hospital. Um, so around the 1920s, they did a study, the first ever... Uh, survey of medical spending in the United States. And, and they looked around, and they, and they sort of discovered something very interesting, which was that uh, medical expenses really were crushing for individuals who got sick. It just had already gotten so expensive that most people, if you had to go to the hospital, if you had a serious illness, you were quickly wiped out of your savings, and you would lose your house, or, uh, or, or you would go bankrupt, or you just wouldn't get the medical care, and you, you, know, you, you would suffer that way. Um, but they also discovered that actually it wasn't that much money for society as a whole. And, and they had sort of stumbled across what they realized was known as the 80-20 rule, which is that any large random group of people, most medical expenses are concentrated in a small group of people. And the number, and you can slice it different ways, but the kind of rule of thumb is that 80% of medical spending in any large group at any one time is concentrated among 20% of the people. And that 20% of the people with really serious chronic diseases, people who have had accidents, heart attacks, etc. Um, and so, it, you know, the, the idea was, uh, well, gee, how do you want to pay for that? Well, one way to pay for that is to spread that risk broadly across that group. Because, you know, reality, you may not be that person who has just had the car accident. You may not be that person who has diabetes or cancer, but you could be. And if you're not now, you could be tomorrow. So everyone's got that chance. And so it makes sense from a moral standpoint to get everybody in one big pool, or at least get them into large pools together where they could share the cost. And happily, that also works economically, because if you do that, pool, you do that risk pooling, that risk sharing, as they call it, um, the expense becomes manageable for everybody. So you know, I myself can't afford uh, the, the cost of going to the hospital, but you know, and if I'm in a group of... 500 people and three of us end up in the hospital and two of us end up needing medical care, well, together we can afford it at a, at a pretty reasonable rate. So the idea was to come up with some kind of system for spreading the risk. And the question was, what does that system look like? Now, every other country in the world looked at this and said, all right, let's get the whole country into one big pool. Let's have a national health insurance system. And these systems evolved in different ways, but they all had that sort of common uh, element of creating the largest possible risk pool. And basically, one way to think of it is it, they totally transferred, or almost totally transferred, the responsibility for medical spending from the individual to society. We basically said this is a collective responsibility, in part because we're all at risk. That's how it's, it's a mutual protection society, if you want to think of it that way. The United States did not go that route for reasons that will have to do with politics and, and such. And instead, we kind of happened upon a system where employers started offering health insurance. And it turned out that large employers make a pretty good risk pool. If you have a large employer, a couple hundred, a couple thousand employees, you get that nice random lease. And it, if you tell the employees when they come on they have to buy health insurance or at least they have to make a decision right away, and you subsidize it through the government and through the tax system, most people will buy it. And you get that nice random group. And employers are able to provide insurance. And that's how our system came to be. 
um, supported over the years. It was, it was encouraged. It was reinforced. The federal government at one point gave a special tax break to group insurance to make it, to make it more attractive. Uh, labor unions got the right uh, to bargain for health benefits. Uh, in World War II, there were wage and price controls, which meant that employers couldn't compete with each other on the basis of offering more salary, but they were allowed to compete with each other on the basis of offering more health insurance. And this, the, it, it kind of caught on, and eventually that was our system. We had an employer system, which was great if you worked for a big employer. But what if you didn't? What if you were old? What if you were poor? Um, what if you worked for an employer, but the employer didn't offer health insurance? And it was pretty apparent that a lot of people were left out of the system. In the 1960s, they kind of patched the holes, and they said, all right, well, we're going to the, the, the biggest group left out of this, obviously, is the elderly because they don't have jobs. They're retired. So we're going to create a program that covers all the elderly, and that's how Medicare came to be. And around the time, they, right when they uh, created Medicare in the same bill, they said, you know what? There's a lot of people uh, who don't have enough money to get health care, so we're going to give them something called Medicaid, although we're not going to give it all Medicaid, only certain people, children, pregnant women, a few other categories over the years. So basically, Medicare and Medicaid came into existence. The employer system uh, was covering, you know, most people who were uh, in, the, in the workforce, but you still had a lot of people who were disconnected from this. In particular, you had people who, even with employer coverage available to them, they still couldn't afford it. And you had people who worked for themselves or worked in part-time jobs or were juggling jobs. And for them, the insurance system was really a mess because insurers had a problem. They said, you know what? These people don't buy through an employer. They're going to buy on their own. And that means each person is going to make their own individual decision. And we know what happens when you do that. We know from experience that if you just go around offering people health insurance, do you want it, do you not, do you want it, do you not, and people see that it's kind of expensive. They're not getting any financial help with it. They're going to say, well, you know, I'm 28. I'm pretty healthy. Eh, I don't think I'll get health insurance. Or, yeah, it'd be nice to get health insurance, but this is kind of pricey. Maybe I want something that just, you know, maybe it'll cover me if I go in the hospital, but I don't want anything else. All right, so now you're not getting those people. But who is going to buy health insurance? Well, I know, you know, I have a family history of, of, of cancer, or, you know, I have really bad allergies, or I'm older and I'm relatively good health, but, you know, I'm at that age where I think, you know, I might start to develop health problems. So those people buy the coverage. And it turns out that when people do that, they're reasonably good at predicting their medical bills. And insurance companies discovered pretty quickly that was a very unstable uh, arrangement because what would happen was basically people in poor health would buy insurance. People who were not in poor health wouldn't buy insurance. They were stuck with these risk pools of people, all of whom had high medical bills, and they realized, oh, my gosh, this is way more expensive than we thought. We have to raise our premiums. So they would raise their premiums. Then even as the premiums got more and more expensive, more and more people looked at that deal and said, uh, if I don't need it, maybe I won't get insurance. And so it became this self-fulfilling cycle, in which in the insurance business is known as the insurance death spiral. And so insurers realized the only way they had to deal uh, to accommodate this, to, to react, was to say, all right, if we're selling to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we're going to have to be really careful who we sell to. So we're going to sort of, first of all, we're going we're gonna to ask you, have you, do you have any pre-existing conditions right now? Do you have a family history of pre-existing conditions? What kind of work do you do? Is it a hazardous uh, uh, occupation where you're likely to get injured? Oh, um, are you a woman? Because, you know, you might get pregnant. Um, and after they were done with all that, and they'd look at your history, and they'd say, well, let's see. Uh, gosh, you know, you know, you look like you're a, a cancer survivor. You could get a relapse. We're just not going to cover you at all. Um, or they might say, well, we'll give you insurance, but, uh, you know, we're not going to cover anything related to your preexisting condition. Which, you know, if you have diabetes was a bit problematic because if you have diabetes, almost anything you show up in the hospital with could plausibly be blamed on your diabetes. And by the way, that was one of the things the insurance companies were famous for doing, which would be giving you insurance. And then when you showed up at the hospital and had a claim, they'd go back through your medical records and they'd say, hey, look at that, you know. Uh, two years ago, you had something, you had an exam, and no one thought anything of it, but it turned out to be a pre-existing condition. We don't have to cover it. You're on the hook for those bills. And that's not a hypothetical, by the way. I've heard stories like that um, all the time. The other thing was these plans that were sold often were missing benefits. You know, and in health insurance, how many of you have ever actually looked at your health insurance benefit book to actually like, see the benefits, right? Okay. I, I do this for a living, and, like, I don't understand it, okay? Um, <laughs> And 
So imagine you're, you're trying to shop for your insurance. You think you're being a sort of smart consumer. You buy what sounds like a good plan, right? It's got like the really nice brochure with a happy looking family on it and you know, <laughs> great access and will keep you healthy. And you go to the doctor and they say, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you, know you have this condition. It's gonna, it has a prescription that, you know, it's you know, $1,000 a month, which is a totally reasonable, you know, not re reasonable, not reasonable. It's a totally normal price get for uh, a drug in this country. And you look at your insurance policy, it says, prescription coverage up to $2,000 per year. Oh. And you're on the hook. And that kind of thing would happen all the time. So it was a real mess for people. And there were lots of people caught up in this uh, system, uh, really, ever you know, since it evolved. Around the 70s and 80s, things got really, uh, the problems got really severe, mostly because healthcare just kept getting more expensive particularly in the United States. And it kept getting more expensive because health insurance in the United States was designed to pay bills, but not to control costs. The original health care plans were designed by hospitals and doctors. And, you know, if you're a hospital and you're designing a health insurance plan, you're probably going to design one that's pretty much going to be a write the check whenever the bill comes in kind of plan. And that's fine, except at some point people started to realize, wait a minute, how do we know the hospitals are actually charging reasonable rates? How do we get these down? How do we know that the services that are always getting ordered up actually make sense? And there was really no way to stop that, so the prices just kept going up and up and up. Um, other countries, because they had these natural systems, were able to set a global budget. They were able to say, all right, this is how much we're going to spend, and then they'd have conversations with the government, would sit down with the doctors and the hospitals and the drug makers and say, this is what we're going to pay for this. But we didn't have anything like that in this country. We couldn't because there were so many different ways of paying in the first place, and second of all, no one wanted to have that kind of global budget. So prices kept getting more and more expensive. It strained business, it strained taxpayers, and eventually it strained individuals. You had more uh, and more people... Uh, who were just really struggling with their bills. And like I said, these are not hypothetical situations. You know, I think if you ever listen to the uh, news and you say, you know, so, you know, so many people don't have health insurance, so many people can't pay their bills. These are real people. And I, I spent a lot of time, I still do spend a lot of time, talking to people in these situations. And, you know, again, going back to a decade ago, you know, right before the debate about the Affordable Care Act started, um, you know, I remember some of the stories. There was a guy uh, named Gary Rotzler who was a, uh, quality engineer at a defense contractor in upstate New York, and he lost his job. Uh, it, was a, it was an outsourcing type thing. He actually ended up going back to work at his old plant, but he was hired back as an independent contractor. And as an independent contractor, he didn't have benefits. And for about two years, they went without the benefits. And his wife, who was feeling these weird aches and pains, didn't get treatment because they always figured, well, he kept asking his uh, bosses if they would give him health insurance. And they were like, yeah, you know, we'll look into it. We'll see if we can add you to the permanent payroll. It never happened. Uh, she finally got an exam, uh, went in, and it turned out she had uh, metastatic cancer and actually died a few months later. Um, and I can't, you know, sit up here and tell you, well, gosh, if they had gotten the health care in time that she'd be alive. I mean, she was actually very young. That kind of cancer is very aggressive. But this much I can guarantee you is that if they had had health insurance, you know, after Gary had buried his wife and figured out how he and his kids were going to get on, um, he wouldn't have had to declare bankruptcy because they were stuck with $80,000 in medical bills. And that kind of thing happened all the time. You know, there was Janice Ramsey, a, a realtor in central Florida who had diabetes and couldn't find insurance until finally a plan came to her. And she's like, great, I can finally buy health insurance. And she paid the premium. She thought she was all set. She was one of those people who went to the hospital, thought she was covered. And it turned out she wasn't covered in her case because, because the market was such a mess there were all kinds of uh, scams and frauds, and she'd been paying in for two years to a company that basically didn't exist. Um, and there's stories like that all over the place, and this was the kind of background uh, where uh, the situation, where things were roughly around 2006, 2007, when uh, at that point there was another presidential campaign, uh, Barack Obama uh, became president, and he had campaigned hard on a promise, uh, I guess he would say it was an audacious promise, uh, to, to do what no president before him had ever done, and that was to sign a universal health care bill, um, to finally achieve something that uh, uh, reformers in this country and presidents uh, since Harry Truman had been trying to do, but unsuccessfully. Um, now, one of the reasons that they had been unsuccessful was that Really, up until for the first 30, 40 years of trying this, Democrats, who have been the party that have really championed the cause 
of healthcare really had in their heads, they had a very specific model of healthcare in mind. And, and basically, it was what we would call a single payer system, where the government would give everybody health insurance. And, and, and we'll talk a little later about what the different ways you can construct it, but that was basically the idea they had. Um, but over the years, they just couldn't get headway on it. They could not get there. Um, in the 1990s, when Bill Clinton became president and uh, uh, appointed Hillary Clinton to run the health care task force, they sat down and they said, is there some other way to do this? Can we find a way to get to universal health care that doesn't involve creating a big government program that's going to scare off people who don't like taxes, it's going to scare off people who don't like government, it's going to scare off people who like their employer insurance and don't want to get rid of it. And they, they kicked around a bunch of ideas and they came up with a system where basically they would keep private insurance, private ins everyone would still be getting coverage, Not, the elderly would keep uh, Medicare, but everyone else would get private insurance, but uh, you wouldn't get it through your job anymore. You know, you, you, you'd buy it, you'd shop for it, and it would be provided by one of the big insurance companies. And, and, and people forget, I mean, this is ancient history, I'm old enough that I remember this. Um, when he first proposed this plan, I mean, it was really, it was a, it was a classic Bill Clinton moment. The, the story is that when he got up in front of Congress to introduce it, they loaded the wrong speech on the teleprompter. And for 10 minutes, just out of his head, he gave the bright speech until the teleprompter caught up to where he was supposed to be. It was a broad, you know, amazing performance. You know, the pundits were all like, oh my God, that was the greatest speech ever. They're going to create national health care. And Bob Dole, who was leader of the Senate Republicans, was like, oh, we're going to pass something for sure. It's just a matter of what it'll look like. And, you know, basically eight months later, the thing was dead. Uh, it was just, I mean, it, 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 it was like the most unpopular bill in Congress. Uh, the Democrats took a thrashing in the midterms in nine, 1994, and that had like a psychic, deep psychic wound on health care reformers, all of whom were like, okay, we can't do that again. The next time we get a shot, we really got to come up with some other way to do universal health care. And so they spent the intervening years after the mid-90s in think tanks and, 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 and writing journal papers and having debates at the state level. And, and all you people here are like, you know, when you see like an academic conference on like, you know, a policy uh, meeting, you know, ideas, you know, white papers for any issue, don't think those things don't matter. They do matter because that's exactly what the Democrats were doing for, you know, five, six, seven years. And they kind of finally settled on a, on a, on a, on a different model for universal coverage that they hoped would be easier to pass and less disruptive once it got in. And it was pretty straightforward. The, not, part one was, we're going to give every low-income American Medicaid. Medicaid works well for low-income Americans. Let's stop restricting it just to women who are pregnant and, you know, children. And Let's just say if your income is below 130% of the poverty, 35% of the poverty line, you get Medicaid. Bingo, done. So you kind of take care of that group. And then let's look at the part of the private health insurance system, the working uh, age population that's left out. All these people who are struggling trying to buy insurance on their own. Well, the problem is we don't, we don't have that 80-20 rule. We can't, you know, the, the insurance companies don't want to sell anyone if they're sick. The plans are junk plans. So let's fix that with what came to be known as the three-legged stool. How many people know the three-legged stool? Okay. So quickly, the three-legged stool was number one, we're going to tell insurance companies you can't discriminate against pre-existing conditions. People, it doesn't matter what they have or had or what risk they have, you have to sell them a policy and, if they want it, and you can't charge them more. In addition, you can't sell junk policy. We are going to set a standard for insurance. It's going to have to include 10 essential benefits, every plan. So that means not just you know, outpatient, physician, hospitalization. That means real prescription coverage that you know, will cover whatever you need. Mental health care, which so many plans, you know, in the individual market, if you were buying your own, it was almost impossible to find a plan that covered psychiatric benefits. Um, and maternity care, have to cover maternity care. No, no, no questions asked. So uh, that was the first part of the stool, the sort of regulation on health care. And so the insurance company was like, okay, but if you're going to tell us we have to sell to everybody, even if they're sick, you've got to make sure people buy it. So they said, all right, we'll pass a mandate. We'll say that if you don't get health insurance, you're going to have to pay a tax penalty. That was the second part of the, uh, the stool. The third part of the stool was the subsidies, because he said, oh, wait a minute, if you're going to actually require people to get health insurance or penalize them, a lot of people can't afford it. It's just way too expensive. So all right, we'll give people subsidies. We'll tell them, you know, based on your income, we will give you the money that, so you will be able to afford it. And the subsidies, by the way, wouldn't just help make it affordable for people, but also studies have shown that it would work kind of like the mandate did in bringing everybody into the system. And the hope was that with the subsidies and the mandate, you'd get lots of people in, the insurance companies would get this nice, 
you know, nice 80-20 mix of healthy people and unhealthy people. And you'd create basically uh, groups of uh, insurance pools that operated like employer groups did. And again, the focus here was on taking medical expenses away from each individual, saying it doesn't have to, we're not gonna make, you know, make every person individually responsible for their care, because we know that no one individually could ever do this. We're gonna spread it to a broad group, and that's how we're gonna take care of it. So that was the second part. The third part was a recognition that over the long term, all of these problems are driven by the fact that healthcare is so damn expensive in this country. And, and you've probably heard that we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. I don't think people appreciate like how far from the norm we are. I mean, we, it's not like, you know, basically, you know, you know, we usually measure these things by percent of GDP. And it's not like, you know, England's at 10% and Sweden's at 12% and we're at 13%. It's like England's at 10%, Sweden's at 12% and we're at 18. It's a huge allocation of resources. And as long as you're spending that much on healthcare, no matter how you slice it, that's going to be more money than most people can afford individually because you have to spread that over the, the whole society. So over the long run, you will never solve the problems of American health care if you don't get that cost down. So the, 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 the health care reformers, Obama, his allies, they thought, all right, we're going to do what we can to get health care costs down. They had a bunch of ideas. They had a bunch of, a lot of them were what we call delivery reform, like giving hospitals incentives through Medicare to provide better care. Um, they also had an idea of changing that tax preference for employer insurance, uh, which economists said, you know, you're making employer insurance such a good deal for people, they end up buying more insurance than they would otherwise, and that's inefficient. So let's get rid of that. Um, uh, so they, the, 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 the basic approach, again, it was, Medicaid for the poor, the three-legged stool for people who couldn't get private insurance, and then uh, cost control. Now, this wasn't just some, you know, pie-in-the-sky idea. It wasn't just something they, they drew, up, drew up on paper. They actually had reason to think this would work, and the reason was the state of Massachusetts. Um, Massachusetts has always been among the most aggressive about uh, passing uh, what you know, most people call progressive reforms, and Massachusetts, for somewhat quirky reasons in this case, decided to go ahead and give a shot to creating some kind of universal health care system or something that came close to it. And they did. And there were a lot of things that, you know, looked pretty good about it. Um, one was the fact that it was bipartisan. The governor of Massachusetts at the time was a guy named uh, Willard Romney. You may know him by his nickname, Mitt. Um, uh, Mitt actually worked very closely with the late senator from Massachusetts, Ted Kennedy in Washington on this, and they, and, they, and they worked with the state legislature in Massachusetts, which was democratically controlled, and they came together. And actually, if you uh, go to Boston and you see the portrait of Mitt Romney, um, you know, the two things on his desk, the official governor's portrait, one is a picture of his wife. That's sweet. I would do that, too. <laughs> you do that for me, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, she's thinking... Maybe not so much now, but okay. Uh, and, and the second thing was it's a copy of the Massachusetts health care law, which, you know, was always a little bit of a joke when he was running for president and saying they needed to repeal the law that was based on this, but, you know, whatever. Um, and it wasn't just that it was bipartisan, but it was that there was buy-in from everybody. Everybody kind of got on board with this. Business leaders were very much on board with this. The, the leaders of the major hospitals and health care systems, uh, labor union leaders, because everybody said, all right, we all think this works for all of us. They, they really went to the effort of trying to get everyone to buy into it and then promote it. I mean, this thing was so universally supported that the Boston Red Sox got behind it. Um, those of you who know me know how much how I feel about it, how wonderful that makes me feel. But uh, literally, there were players from the Red Sox who were doing ads saying, hey, you've got to go buy health insurance because that's the law. And they're referring to the mandate in Massachusetts. And, you know, the results were pretty good. Uh, Massachusetts got down to basically 98% of the population covered, which was the most in the country. And, you know, it was by no means perfect. There were lots of people who were like, you know, my insurance really sucks. It's got really high deductibles. It's too expensive. I can't see the doctors I want. But overall, people were generally happy with it. And they looked real carefully at, like, what, you know, what was gained. They found, you know what, people were more financially secure. Uh, they had better access to health care. And years later, there was, a, there was some really good rigorous studies. I want to say they were in the New England Journal of Medicine. I, I, I uh, uh, can't... Uh, I can't uh, remember, it might have been JAMA, but they really did a, a, a good study by a guy named Ben Summers, who's an uh, uh, economist at Harvard, and found that actually, you know, they, they compared actually significant reductions in mortality 
when people were living longer because of this law. So it was a big success, and everybody saw that, and they said, all right, we're going to do what they did in Massachusetts. We're going to do that in Washington, D.C. for the whole country. And that sounded great. Except it turns out that Washington, D.C. is a little bit different than Boston. And um, they quickly ran into political resistance. They had to make the compromise that you know, everyone knew they would have to make. Um, but to get those interest groups on board, they had to basically give a kind of, they had to go easy on pharma, on the pharmaceutical industry. You know what, we're not going to press you too hard on your prices. Um, they, you know, had this idea of a public insurance plan that was going to act as like a, as like a safety valve in case coverage uh, didn't come down because they had to ditch that. Um, they had to, in part, to bring along more conservative members of the Democratic caucus, they had to really give the states a ton of autonomy and power over how to implement the law rather than have one big federal program. Hold on to that thought, because we're going to get to that in a second. Um, and of course, they had to deal with the realities of American government, which included, among other things, the fact that to pass uh, major legislation in the United States Senate and really do what you want to do, you had to overcome the filibuster, which meant you needed to get 60 votes. And the Senate, as it is, is designed, because it's two, you know, two senators for every state. So the senator of Wyoming has you know, the same amount of power as the senator from New York even though the entire state of Wyoming could like, fit in like one block in Brooklyn. Um, and that uh, really constrained what they were able to do. And uh, you know, one of the big results was that by the time they were done passing this law, it, it didn't look exactly like the Massachusetts law. Uh, and not only because the states had all this power to do it, and the regulations were weaker, they had to really kind of cut back on what they were spending. And I, and I go back to this, I think this is underappreciated that the original legislation would have been much more generous in terms of the financial assistance it provided to people who were buying health insurance. The, uh, uh, the one that came out the other end, it had really, it really gone kind of skimpy on that financial assistance. And that meant people were going to be getting a lot less help when they went to go buy health insurance. Now, for all of that, for all of those compromises, the law did mostly what it was supposed to do. Uh, the Medicaid expansion where the, you know, the states that implemented it, uh, millions of people got health insurance. And we know from studies that these people are better off. They're getting better access to care. They're healthier. And uh, in states that really threw their, 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 their hearts into it, uh, the marketplace, the, the, the three-legged stool, the exchanges where they're buying products, that worked pretty well, too. I mean, the, the sort of poster child for success uh, was California, which... Actually, when Massachusetts was doing its bill, California wanted to do one, too, and they just couldn't get it through the legislature, also with a then-Republican governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, uh, and the, um, California really threw its heart into it, and California really you know, regulated their plans really aggressively, and they did things like saying, you know, beyond what was in the law, they said things like, you know what, we're going to really limit how much out-of-pocket spending you're going to have to do even for routine care, which is really important. If you think about a consumer trying to buy a health plan, you know, if you see that, you know, you're going to have to pay a ton every time you go to the doctor, particularly if you're the marginal, healthy person, you're going to be like, wait, I have to pay 50 bucks, 100 bucks to go get an exam? And if you think that's your only health care for the year, you might not buy the plan. But if you hear that actually it'll only be $25, then you're more likely to do it. They also really restricted the kinds of plans available. There's a lot of literature on this that shows that, in general, too much choice confuses people, but if you simplify it, it gets much easier. So California worked, you know, the, it worked more or less like they drew it up on paper. Then you had states like Iowa, um, where they didn't, you know, the state resisted creating its own, you know, exchange for the plans, you know, to buy the plans, where the state didn't put any effort into helping people to enroll. And the big thing was, and this was partly responsible, a uh, 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 result of thing the Obama administration did, but later on it was because of the state. They created a situation for where the majority of people buying insurance on their own got to stay in plans that didn't comply with the Affordable Care Act, older plans. And so basically, these were the plans that existed before, and they weren't available to people with pre-existing conditions. They didn't have all the, all the benefits. And so what you had happening was people who stayed in those plans were healthy people, right? Because they were fine with those plans. They had them in the first place, and it wasn't a big deal. But people who were sick jumped into the plans that were newly available. Well, the insurers that were providing these newly available Affordable Care Act plans, these Obamacare plans, uh, we're like, oh my God, we're not getting 80, 20, we're just getting the 20, who costs the 80? And we have to raise premiums. Um, and some of them just closed up shop altogether. So they really struggled. And you saw that in a lot of states, not just Iowa and Tennessee and Arizona. And there were, in general, it was the states that wanted it to work, found ways to make it work. The states that didn't want it to work were the ones 
that had the most problems. Um, now, the people who were struggling, if you looked at the numbers, by and large, and you, and you looked how many people were better off, how many people were worse off, I, I, I've looked at these numbers a bunch of different times. I think it's not at all ambiguous that the number of people who were better off because of the Affordable Care Act was not just bigger than the ones who were worse off, but like substantially bigger. The fact is the people who were worse off, they were in real pain. They also got a lot of attention from the media and politicians, which is, you know, the way the media works. We always try to spotlight, you know, where the problems are. But it became, you know, it generated a lot of political momentum behind the idea of, you know, we need to do something different. We need to do something better. And one of the politicians who picked up on that was a guy named Donald Trump. Now, you may have noticed that Donald Trump is not exactly a details kind of guy. Um, having observed the White House on health care policy, dealt with it at various times, you know, I think it's fair to say that on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, he doesn't have the most sophisticated grasp of, of health care uh, and, and what works and, and, and what doesn't. Um, but I do think he had a pretty good instinct for the fact that there were people suffering. And he, and, and he addressed that. And he said, we're going to give everybody great health care for less money. Great health care for less money. Yay, who doesn't like that? And, you know, in doing that, he was picking up on what his fellow Republicans had been saying for seven years, ever since the Affordable Care Act. They said, we can do better. He said, this Obamacare is a disaster. We have a better way to do this. Your health care will be more generous. It will cost you less money. It'll be less hassle. You won't have to put up with that stupid financial penalty. You won't have to pay more taxes. You'll see any doctor you want. Great health care, less money. Just give us a chance to get in there and change it, and we will make everything better. And you know, then the darndest thing happened. <laughs> they got their chance. And um, they looked around. They're like, um, um, now what do we do? And I know that sounds really harsh, but I, I, I say this as a description, not a value judgment. Um, if you watched the years leading up to the Affordable Care Act, um, the, the, the amount of energy that was spent trying to work out the policy and work out the differences and negotiate among the interest groups and the politics, it may have recreated a terrible plan, it may have created a great plan, something in between, but there were years of effort, and they tried to, they, they worked through every de mind-numbing detail, trust me, because I had to write about it all, and my God, some of it was boring. <laughs> um, Republicans never did that. They never did that work. They did not spend the seven years they were out of power to really get behind it. And it was remarkable when, when, when the Obama administration took over, Democrats were all on the same page pretty much about what to do. They would argue about how generous it should be or this detail, but they, the, same, the shape of things was clear to them. Republicans had not done that. And that was a problem because it turned out that they, had, they didn't have a plan, but they didn't have priorities. Their priorities were to spend less government money, in part to reduce taxes, they wanted to regulate insurance, reduce regulation on insurance so the free market could operate more. And they wanted less cross-subsidy. They wanted less rich paying for the poor, healthy paying for the sick. They wanted to move the responsibility for health care more on to the individual. Every single one of these is a totally legitimate, totally defensible uh, 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 principle. Um, you could argue, you know, less taxes is better for the economy. Uh, if you regulate insurance, it's just it's going to stifle. You know, they're not going to be innovative. If you have, you know, put too much pressure on prices, you'll stop development of drugs. Um, and why, you know, you could argue on the cross subsidy, it's inefficient, or you could argue it's immoral. I mean, why should somebody, you know, they, they would say, you know, some people, you know, if they're if they're healthy and they do things to be healthy, why should they have to pay more? Why should a dude have to pay for, you know, maternity care? I mean, he's not going to get pregnant. Um, and all of these things are defensible, you know? I mean, they're logical, coherent arguments. The problem is you cannot do those things and give great health care to everyone for less money. It is not possible. It is math, simple math. You cannot do it. Health care costs a lot of money. And if you want to give to everyone, you're going to have to spend a lot of money. You're going to have to raise from the population. And if you want to create a system where everyone's cross-subsidizing each other, where you're having society pick it up so no individual is exposed, then you're going to have healthy people paying for the sick and you're going to have rich people paying for the poor. There is no way around that basic fact. And that contradiction was always there. And when the Republicans got in office and start to uh, do, try to craft a repeal bill, um, they suddenly discovered that. Now, for a little bit, it looked like they wouldn't matter. They said they were going to run ahead, they were going to repeal the, the law, and then come up with a replacement later. 
But um, in, in possibly the first time in history, Democrats and progressives actually all got on the same page really quickly and said, wait a minute, we are going to demand that you tell us what you're going to do. That's our demand. That was the line in the sand that they all drew. Okay, if you want to repeal it, fine, but we want to know what's coming next. Show us your hand. And then for the first time, the people who had benefited from the law actually started to come out and start to sort of make a big fuss about it and said, these are the people who benefited. We are the ones who depend on this. What are you going to do for us? And remarkably, uh, that changed the political equation almost overnight. It was really remarkable to watch how quickly the poll numbers on repeal nosedived as soon as people started thinking, well, wait a minute. Wait, we don't really like the Affordable Care Act. It's got all these problems. But wait, this doesn't sound better. And the CBO would do their estimates of the plans, and all of them would turn out to they'd leave millions of people without insurance. They'd restore, you know, pre exclusions for pre-existing conditions would come back. And, um, you know, I don't want to say this was overdetermined. At the end of the day, some of you may remember, it was exactly one vote that stopped repeal from happening. And you don't have to think too hard of hypotheticals that get you to that one more vote. But at the same time, there are certain principles we know in political science. Among them are, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to take benefits away from people once you give them to them. And also that, you know, uh, 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 people don't like change. And I think that spoke to also what the Affordable Care Act actually achieved, which was not just giving insurance to millions of people, not just helping millions of people, but also setting a standard for what people expected from society, that they actually expected coverage pre-existing conditions. They actually expected that poor people should be able to get health and care. And they actually expected that people who weren't poor but couldn't afford their coverage should get financial assistance. Now, of course, the catch was that insofar as the Affordable Care Act set up this standard of affordable care for all, it didn't meet that. It still had millions of people with no insurance, millions of people with coverage who couldn't pay their bills. And so that's where we are today. Well, what are we going to do about that? Now, the approach, what has happened in the last year from the Trump administration, this is where I'm going to check my phone, Nope, not yet, um, uh, has been to do what they can through regulation. Uh, the big push is to try and change, uh, the, the, to make it possible to buy more of those plans that used to uh, exist where that excluded pre-existing conditions and don't have all the benefits. Um, and they took away the mandate. They took away the penalty. They took away one of the stools. So it's now like a three-legged stool with two stools. So, you know, that kind of goes, eh, false. <laughs> Um, the weird thing is they haven't actually, you know, a lot of people thought the whole thing would collapse at that point, at least the part, you know, the three-legged stool part. But actually, because the subsidies are still there, because they're, and they're still, there turns out lots of people want coverage, you know, coverage, the comprehensive benefits, and lots of people have pre-existing conditions, that you still have this big market for people buying those plans. So they can't, you know, can't get killed uh, altogether. But among people who are, who are you know, not getting those subsidies now. The prices of their plans have gone way, way up. They're not getting financial assistance. And a lot of them are going to end up sort of going to these sort of substandard plans because it's all they can afford. And that's the kind of evolution we're headed towards, a, a world where uh, uh, people who are lower income and some middle income get financial assistance, can buy the kind of coverage that the Affordable Care Act envisioned, and people who make a little more than that middle, upper middle class people who are kind of basically back where they were before the law um, took effect. So that's where they are. Um, the other option, obviously, is to go the other direction and try to finish the journey and try to transfer uh, fully, you know, get to universal coverage, everybody, and, and, and finish this sort of transfer of, of medical uh, expenses from the individual to the, to the group. Now, you can do that just by tinkering with the Affordable Care Act, say, like, all right, fix the things that went wrong, make it more generous, give people better subsidies, but, you know, you still end up with a fairly confusing system. You still end up with the problems of insurance and networks that people don't like. And that's why we see this new interest, again, in single payer. Um, and it's partly a reaction to the policy idea that maybe in the end of the day, it just is easier to have a one government plan. And part of it is, frankly, a political judgment of Democrats who are like, you know what? We killed ourselves to kind of come up with something that we thought would get Republican buy-in. It didn't get Republican buy-in. They spent seven years trying to repeal it. They're still trying to repeal it screw it, let's do what we want, and let's go ahead and do a single-payer plan. Now, single-payer takes lots of different forms, and I need to wrap up, so if you want, I can talk about that. I actually just got back from Taiwan, which is like one of the only truly single-payer systems in the world. Um, but uh, the one thought I want to leave you with is that when we talk about single-payer, it's important to be specific about what that means. Single-payer can really mean, you know, having a government plan that just displaces, you know, private insurance and you get rid of it all. But a lot of people, they think of something else more like 
uh, well, let's create a public plan that looks like Medicare, but it's optional. You know, people can stay with their employer plan or on it, or they can jump into it. And another way to think of single payer is that single payer isn't an either or thing. It's actually a set of different principles. It's, it's comprehensive insurance for everybody. It's, it's automatically enrolling people. It's having the government set prices. You can think of it as like a couple different dials. You can dial them all up or down. And if it's not possible to get to a single payer system today or tomorrow or a week from now or a month, or, well, not a month, obviously, but you know, a year or 10 years, you can slowly turn those dials and you can make headway. And you may eventually get to something that looks like what, say, Bernie Sanders, who's very much responsible for this discussion right now, envisions. You may not. You may get to something that looks a little different, may actually look more like some of the other systems abroad. But um, I think one of the lessons uh, is that you can make progress in, in sort of steps. Um, you know, you look at the Affordable Care Act, did it get a lot wrong? Absolutely. Um, did it accomplish a lot? Yeah, it did. And obviously, people can disagree about uh, whether uh, uh, the pros outweigh the cons, the, the benefits were worth the cost. Um, but I think if you take one lesson from the last year is that there's a lot of people unhappy with where healthcare is today, but not a lot of people who want to go back. And I'm going to stop there. So there you go. And I think we have microphones for questions if anybody has. I think they got a mic coming. So you say it'll be hard to go back. Do you think there's any likelihood that the individual mandate will be restored or that the level of benefits will be enforced at the higher levels? So I think there's roughly less than 1% chance of a national a mandate being restored on the national level at this point. I don't think anyone's going to go there. Um, a couple states have already done it. I think you could see a few more trying. Um, I think there's a sense now, and it's really interesting, a lot of uh, literature that the mandate mattered less than they thought it was going to, partly because it wasn't that big. And, you know, you can get that effect uh, through, you know, you can increase the subsidies. That will help, you know, there's different, the point of the mandate is to get healthy people to buy coverage, right? So if you make coverage more financially attractive, that will have the same effect. You can uh, tinker around with automatic enrollment, which is something you hear about. But I actually think more likely, like, we're seeing that the, the program works without the mandate. It just doesn't work that well. And I think in the long run, I, I, think, I think there will be enthusiasm for it, and they will pass incremental reforms if Democrats get power. Who knows? You know, if, even Republicans. I mean, I could see, I can imagine a scenario where the second part of Trump's first term, you know, Democratic Congress, if they get it, they pass it, and he signs because... Who the heck knows what he's going to do? Um, but uh, uh, I think long run, I think the, 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 the among center-left Democrats, there's just a sense of we've pushed this model as far as we can go, and, um, and that's why there's such an appetite for something a little different, uh, you know, something that involves a kind of public insurance plan that will, will absorb people. And I think that's, you know, it's, 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 it's complicated to get the universal coverage that way, but I think that's probably the more likely route. I could be wrong. Hi, thanks. Um, so after like 20 years of wanting association health plans, the National Federation of Independent Business announces, yeah, we're not going to do that. And I think they were one of the original originalists on that. Um, I also heard a presentation one time by one of the major business organizations who they pretty much said, you know, we really hate this Affordable Care Act, but we stood back because we thought it was never going to happen. So we weren't engaged in it, but we, we really don't like it. What does business want? And they, I've also, you know, the other thing is we hear a lot from them about um, this is really a burden on employers and um, it's just too expensive and we don't like it. But when we get into the business of saying, well, maybe we'll take employers out of it and have single payer, that, that, that doesn't really fly either. So. What what do they want, especially since they just had this chance to really, like, NFIB could have set up a national association plan that all of these organs, all of their members could have bought into. Turns out, I guess, healthcare is too hard, or? You know, what's yeah, it is. I mean, there's, that's a complicated story because, in part, they couldn't, they wanted something that was even more, uh, they, 
background, there are these things called association health plans, which would allow small businesses to pool. A National Federation of Independent Business, which represents small businesses, is a very powerful conservative lobby, has long urged Congress, going back to like the 90s, 1990s, to make it possible for these plans to cross state borders and basically offer these very cheap plans that are only, you know, don't have all the benefits. And, you know, they'd be attractive to small business because they don't cost much and they'd be cheap and people would benefit from them. Just like with the other, you know, there's always some people who benefit from those because if you're healthy, then you don't pay much in premiums and you don't get sick, you're fine. But if you get sick, you're kind of screwed. Um, did I say that? I guess I did. Um, and, uh, uh, and so NFIB like, has been lobbying for 25 years for these plans, and the Trump administration passed a regulation saying, yes, we can do it, and now they're not going to do one after all that. They're like, oh, we don't really want to offer one of these plans. I think that's partly because within they couldn't make it as friendly to the NFIB as NFIB wanted in the end. But the question of employers is really important. Um, because I, and there, it's like for the longest time, you know, it was always, you know, you sort of look at this, say, employers like, oh my God, healthcare benefits, they're like killing me, we gotta do something about this. And there's always like, you know, Mr. Single Payer over here, or Mr. National Health Insurance. I, you know, and, and by the way, like the French system or the German system, neither of them are single payer, but pretty much give you the same benefits. They're not single payer, so I'm, I'm gonna call it National Health Insurance instead. So Mr. National Health Insurance over here, says, well, gee, you know, we'd be happy to take that off your hands and, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about it. And almost always, not always, CEO of Name Your Company says, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And as best I can tell, having, like, talked to them, it's like, this, it, it's a control thing. I honestly, they, they do not, it, there's, it's, it's one part, if, you're, if, you, if you run a business, you are naturally... Totally understandably skeptical of any regulation on you, skeptical of anything that's going to raise your taxes indirectly or directly. And as far as you're concerned, healthcare may be killing you, but you're going to lower those costs better than the government will. And I really, I mean, that's really it. And that's not universal, um, but it's why you, you know, you hear. And actually, I think this thing, you know, this new thing with Atul Gawande starting with the three companies, and and he's if anyone can do this, he can. Um, but, you know, the number of times I've heard CEOs uh, walk in and say, oh, healthcare, what a mess. How stupid are these people? I can fix this. <laughs> you know. Great. I, I think they're saying, like, are there any CEOs in the audience? <laughs> I, I think, like, to be a CEO, you just, like, like, the ego requirement is just, like, you know, like, you have to think you can solve anything. <laughs> I built a business, so, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go somewhere. I have really bad to go. Uh, get myself in trouble. Um, anybody else? You, the gentleman from Boston. So, Jonathan, thanks for a great talk. But what about Medicaid, the future of Medicaid? So we're hearing about work requirements. Kentucky's was about to roll out on July 1st, the federal court put an end to that, put it on hold. Uh, Maine passed 60% of voters approved Medicaid expansion, and the governor said, I'll go to jail before I implement it. And which then could Virginia, happen. Yeah, and then Virginia, which resisted Medicaid expansion for eight years, got a Democratic governor, and it looked a little bit like Massachusetts, where they worked out some bipartisan <coughs> agreement to expand Medicaid. So where do you think that's headed in the political environment? So, you know, I mean, the deal with Medicaid expansion, right, this was set up as this sweetheart deal for the states. Federal government picks up almost all the cost of the expansion, and, the, you know, and states would just do it. And then the Supreme Court got in the way in the same decision where they said, yes, the mandate is constitutional. They said, oh, but by the way, if states don't want to expand Medicaid, we'll make it really easy for them to say no. And sure enough, like, basically, you know, originally it was only the really, it was basically a bunch of really liberal states plus Kentucky, for quirky reasons, have to do with their governor that did it. Very successful in Kentucky, by the way. I mean, very popular. Um, you know, and then we've seen, right, this sort of gradual more and more states kind of coming into it for various reasons. Uh, Michigan, obviously, being one of them. Um, you see, I think, a lot of uh, uh, governors who feel like, you know, like any governors, like, this is money for my state. It's jobs. It's less, you know, money we have to spend on charity care. Um, it, the, the resistance is really strong where it's strong. I mean, you, I look at a state like Florida, which is, you know, you know, right there. That's like more than a million people overnight would get health insurance if they expanded Medicaid. And just the state legislature will not go there. Um, 
the, the work requirements are interesting because everyone who knows about work requirements knows that really what they mostly mean is putting paperwork hurdles. I mean, there's a lot of literature on this. And most people who work, who go on Medicaid, are working or there's a reason why they're not working. They're disabled, they're dealing with a sick relative. Um, not everyone. There are, you know, there are people who are, you know, could work and don't, and not being on Medicaid may, you know, give them, you know, reason not to work. Um, but uh, for the most part, it, it sort of thins the roles by sort of making it hard to stay on. You have to file paperwork, and it's complicated. And someone, I think it was Arkansas, there was just a study, like, you have to file online, you know, you have to you know, establish that you're working or getting these credits. And the thing is, like, huge percentage of the people on Medicaid don't have, you know, Internet access at home. So, like, you know. Those are the people who, and I'm, 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 you know, with the Medicaid population, a lot of these are the people who really need health care the most. Um, the interesting thing about the work requirements, the two things are, uh, number one, as you said, a court threw out Kentucky's work requirement, and now they're trying to rework it, and I don't, I'm not deep enough in the legal requirements, of, and this is a legal fight over what the Medicaid law, which was passed in 1965, will and won't let states do, and let the federal government approve under the Trump administration. Um, the politics are kind of interesting, because I know quite a lot of, really hardcore progressive defenders of Medicaid who very quietly during the work requirement were thinking, wow, I really think work requirements are a really bad idea, but you know what? If they get some of these states to buy into it, I'm okay with it. Because at the end of the day, they felt like, you know, for states that might otherwise not expand Medicaid, if it takes a work requirement to do it, all right, you know, let's do that. And then, you know, hopefully over the years, you know, kind of come with a better system. Um, you know, I don't know. I like. I thought like five years ago, four years ago, three, we would have hit the tipping point where the Floridas of the world would. I think like eventually, like I might like the Florida, Georgia, Texas, like one of those three has to go, just as a bellwether, and then I think you'll see a bunch more states join. Um, these ballot initiatives are interesting, right? Idaho and Utah, and I think again that speaks to the fact that like just on a human level, it's a real appealing option for a lot of people. It doesn't cost the state much money. Um, you know, and it brings in economic activity. And, the doc, you know, you always hear the physicians want it, the hospitals want it. Um, and, you know, people actually turn out to like Medicaid. That's the, that was the sort of real revelation of this, is that Medicaid turns out to be quite popular. It's like, Medicaid is terrible. No one wants to be on Medicaid. Actually, most people who are on Medicaid are pretty happy with it. I mean, it's got tons of problems. We could do a whole other hour on the problems of Medicaid, but you guys, it's 4 o'clock. I won't subject you to that. I talked too long. I'm sorry. Yeah. She was giving me the evil eye of my wife back there. It's like, you know, like she's like doing the, the clock. Yeah, yeah. She did that to me at home sometimes, too. <laughs> cool. uh, hi, thank you for uh, speaking. I was just wondering if it's ever been considered to have a large amount of large pools, and each pool has a different level of sick slash poor people, and depending on the pool that you opt into, there's a subsidy corresponding to that. Yeah, so, I mean, employer pools kind of work that way. Right, so, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't want to get too, like, in the weeds here, but, like, you know, uh, the, 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 the pool for, uh, you know, GM, which has an older workforce, is a lot, the, 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 the per person cost is a lot more than the pool at, you know, Apple, which has a much younger workforce, I think. I don't actually know that, but let's assume for sake of argument. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the arguments, I mean, the conservative, a lot of the conservative plans on paper, that's sort of what they would do. And in some ways, that's what's going to happen in some of these states where, like, basically um, the, the subsidized new markets, you know, where the three-legged store work, basically will be much more expensive than a normal pool because they'll just have sick people in them. Not just sick, but, you know, disproportionately. Um, historically, the problem has always been, I mean, in the past, a lot of states actually set up what were called high-risk pools. That was, a, that was a very popular idea where you say, all right, for all these people who can't buy insurance because of pre-existing conditions, we'll set up a high-risk pool. And, you know, you'll be guaranteed coverage and it'll have good benefits. And, and there were one or two states where they worked okay. The problem always was there was never enough money put into them. I mean, always. Like, I, I, even the ones that did work well didn't work well. And so they either had to, they had things that, you know, either they would cap enrollment so people would wait for two years. There's like a waiting list to get onto them. Or you had to pay premiums that were like twice as high as for normal insurance. Or there was a pre-existing condition look-back period, or you, know, you couldn't get coverage. You, know, you could get coverage, but it wouldn't cover your pre-existing condition for a year. So you really couldn't get decent insurance from it, at least not right away. Um, it's just, you know, you can do that. I mean, on paper, you can draw up almost any system, but like experience tells us those things don't work. Um, in general, 
um, you know, looking around the rest of the world, the more mixing you get, the better off you are.